has risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He, is risen. he, is risen. he has risen, risen indeed. indeed. Woo! <laughs>
a miracle that God, you can do amazing things to bring hope into our lives. And so God, let us now offer our hearts in worship to you. And we ask that you fill us with hope so that we might be inspired and transformed by you. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Once again, I'm thank you so thankful for you that you've come to worship with us. I hope you receive a word of encouragement today. So now take your heart and your mind, and, and as we sing the songs, I encourage you not just to sit and to listen, but to offer your praise and thanksgiving to God during this time. So please, worship with us. Once again, I'd like to say welcome to online worship here at Connect Church. I'd like to encourage you to take just a moment now and click on one of the links in the description of this video 
or you can go to the website at connectumc.org and do your online giving for our church. Uh, as always, it's important for us to continue to do the things that we do and be in ministry to our community and the people in the world, and we are only able to do that by your generous offerings. So many of you have been uh, very faithful in keeping up with your offerings and your tithes, so I thank you for that, and I encourage you to continue to do that. If you haven't been able to do that yet, it's really easy to do. You can also mail a check here to the church. The address all is here at the bottom of the screen, or you can log in, as I said, into the website uh, and do your virtual giving. If, for some reason, you have uh, been affected by this virus or anything else during this time, we have many people I know uh, in our country who have been uh, laid off or out of work or have extra expenses for some reason. Um, so if you would like to contact the church, you can email me, uh, call the church phone number, uh, reach out online, and we will be happy to help you. It's part of our commitment as a church to take care of one another. So if you need help, we want to help. So be sure to reach out to me if there's anything that we can do, including financial assistance. Now, I'd like to turn our hearts and minds to communion. Last week, uh, we had an opportunity from 12 to 1 p.m. for you to swing by and pick up a single-serving communion cup. Uh, if you have that, I'd encourage you to go and grab that now. If you do not have that, but you have bread and juice, um, you can go and grab that as well. If you don't and you'd like to come by the church, like once again, between 12 and 1 p.m. today, I will be here available for a uh, drop off and pick up of, or pick up of communion. Uh, you can swing by. We'll have a, a bag. We will put your communion uh, in that bag. We'll write your name on it. You can go and swing by the curb and pick it up, a, a no-contact delivery, as they call it. Um, so swing by at any time. You can email me at adam at connectumc.org, and I will put your information, uh, your name on that, on that bag, and you can swing by and, and pick it up at any time, and I'd love to have you do that. But now, let us turn our hearts and minds to communion. On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he gathered with his disciples in the upper room, and he took bread, and he broke it. He gave it to them, and he said, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, and he said, This is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you do it, remember me. And so for nearly 2,000 years, Christians around the world have gathered together to experience God's grace in this way. And we do it once again, knowing that God is present and that we will experience God's grace. Let us pray. Lord God, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ so that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by your blood. Make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. For your Son, Jesus Christ, with your Holy Spirit and in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, now and forever, Almighty Father. Amen. I hope you've received the sacrament of Holy Communion and allowed God's grace to wash over you. As I said, I'll be here from 12 to 1 today. If you don't have anything available and you'd like to come by and pick up one of the the cups that I've said a blessing over, I'd love to see you then. Otherwise, please continue to worship with us on this wonderful, wonderful Easter morning. Speaking the Father. 
by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony, everyone overcome. We will overcome by the blood. like you've come every year before and like you'll come every year after. Indeed, you have risen from the grave. We thank you for all that that means to us, for sacrificing yourself so much and loving us so much that you saved us from our sins in this world. Be with us today on this Easter Sunday. Help us to be an Easter people, that we can serve you in this crisis that we're in and can continue to serve you forever. We love you, Lord. We thank you for what you've done for us. And we ask that you be with us now and forever. From heaven to earth, our Savior King. From us on a cross, he bled and died. And from the cross to an empty grave, he rose to life. He rose to life. He reigns, reign in power. He reigns, name above all names. Hallelujah, now forever. Hallelujah, Christ is Glory to Him upon the throne, forever exalted and seated high, the Lamb of God. Hallelujah, now forever, hallelujah, Christ is risen. And on that day, with Him I'll rise, for Christ, He lives in me. This life I live, no longer mine for Christ lives in me and on that day with him I rise for Christ he lives in me this life I live no longer mine for Christ he lives in me power. He lives the name above all names. Hallelujah, now forever. Hallelujah, 
Christ is risen, he lives, reigning in power, he lives, name of of all names, hallelujah, Christ forever, hallelujah, Christ is risen. Now there was a man named Joseph, a member of the council, a good and upright man, who had not consented to their decision and action. He came from the Judean town of Arimathea, and he himself was waiting for the kingdom of God. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body. Then he took it down, wrapped it in linen cloth and placed it in a tomb cut in the rock, one in which no one had yet been laid. It was preparation day, and the Sabbath was about to begin. The women who had come with Jesus from Galilee followed Joseph and saw the tomb and how his body was laid in it. Then they went home and prepared spices and perfumes. But they rested on the Sabbath in obedience to the commandment. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women, because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves. and he went away wondering to himself what had happened. Good morning. It is true that Jesus has risen. I'm so excited that you've joined us for this Easter Sunday. You know, I've been uh, talking to pastor colleagues of mine from around the state and, and seeing things on social media, and there's a lot of sort of somberness about the fact that we don't get to meet together and celebrate Easter as, as a community. We have to meet virtually. And, and there was a, such a bummer that the social distancing thing is happening during the season of Easter. And, and I, I get that, believe me. I love gathering together and doing the Easter egg hunt and, and saying it is risen together and, and seeing everybody dressed up in their, their Easter dresses and their fancy clothes. And it, it's, it's maybe my favorite day of the year. And so I, I get the sadness. But, but I also understand what Easter is all about. Easter is a day of hope that happens in a time of darkness. And, and you and I are in desperate need of some hope right now. And so it's, it's, it's my great privilege, I think, to get to celebrate Easter with you, that Easter happens in the midst of this really confusing and, and scary time. And, and we get to take a moment and remember the power of Jesus Christ and the power of, of his resurrection and how much hope 
that brings into us. The, the story that was read at the beginning of, of uh, the sermon today was the story from, of the resurrection at the end of the Gospel of Luke. And you saw that the disciples didn't have a ton of hope. When the, when the women came and told the disciples, hey, Jesus is, is come back, they didn't believe her. They thought that, that they, were, they were talking nonsense. And I know Peter got up and went and checked, but they were confused. They, they didn't have a lot of confidence. They were hopeless. And, and why shouldn't they be, right? Let's, let the, the Scripture tells us over and over again that, that the disciples were, were very afraid at the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. He was supposed to be the guy. He was supposed to be the one that would, that would come into Jerusalem and rally the people of Israel to himself. And they would raise up and they would build a new kingdom and they would get independence from Rome. And they would have their homes back and their autonomy back. And, and they would have God's chosen people back. And, and they could do the things that they wanted to do. And, and they had this, this amazing hope of, of the incredible things that Jesus was going to do. And then he was killed. When he arrived at Jerusalem and there was a big parade, there, there wasn't a, a crowning and a, and a raising of an army or sitting on a throne. There was an execution. And all of the disciples were, were terrified then. Is, are the Romans going to come after us too? Are they going to kill us? And they would hide. And they were hopeless. That's why when the women came and told the disciples, the disciples didn't believe them because they had lost hope all hope. We see it again in in John 20. It says this, when it was evening on that day, the first of the week, and the doors of the house, uh, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for the fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. You see, the disciples were so afraid that they had locked themselves in a house from fear of being executed themselves. The, the disciples of Jesus Christ were not brave, and they were not hopeful after the resurrection. They were afraid, and they were hopeless. And then Jesus, Jesus showed up. Jesus arrived. People don't just come back from the dead once they've been killed. But, but on that day, 2,000 years ago, Jesus did. They went from complete hopelessness and darkness and locked, huddled in a home to Jesus coming back. He was there. And, and suddenly, every bit of reason and thought and, and, and skepticism about what was and was not possible vanished. And from that day forward, the disciples and the Christians that came after him, including you and I, we were suddenly given permission to have an irrational hope because he is risen. Jesus Christ conquered death, and because of that, we can be hopeful no matter what. We can have an irrational hope. And so for the next few weeks, we are going to be talking about what it means to be irrationally hopeful. But before we do that, I I want to make sure that we understand a couple of really serious things. The first is this, is that the followers of Jesus are sober about pain, hardship, and challenges. When we talk about irrational hopefulness, I want to make sure that we are not talking about burying our heads in the sand. The disciples of Jesus Christ know what it is to suffer. They know what it is to, to sacrifice, to feel pain. Uh, you see through the scripture, all of the disciples uh, were martyred, it seems. We see the Apostle Paul uh, going through a great deal of suffering and hardship. And since that time, Christians throughout the generations have endured pain and hardship and difficulty and suffering in a variety of ways, and including you and I today. And so when we talk about a rational fear, we're not talking about ignoring pain and hardship. We're, talk, we're not talking about pretending that pain and hardship and challenges don't exist. What we're talking about is being hopeful in the midst of all of that. When, when the rest of the world and the rest of the people are afraid and, and they don't know what to do, you and I have permission to be irrationally hopeful because Jesus came back from the dead And because Jesus came back from the dead, there is nothing that he cannot do. Let's look at Revelation 21, 4. It says this, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. 
Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. Some of the hardship and difficulty that we face in our lives are big. Those things that bring about tears and, and, and mourning and crying and pain, as Revelation said, the things that, that bring about that stuff, those, those are not little things. These are things that are, are overwhelming. When you, when you get yourself in a, in a place or find yourself in a place of, of mourning and pain and hardship, it can seem as if nothing else matters. It can seem as if, as if all of that pain and suffering and hardship will engulf you in a way and, and you will never, ever be able to escape. But even in a, when it feels like that pain is overwhelming, even when it feels like there is no place to go and no place to turn, we have Easter. And that is why disciples of Christ should have irrational hope. We are not meant to have a, a rational hopelessness or a rational fear. We are meant to be a people of irrational hope and irrational fearlessness. On, on, on the day, on Saturday, so Jesus was, was executed on Friday. On Saturday, I always picture Mary Magdalene, maybe uh, John, maybe uh, Mary the mother of James and, and Jesus, sitting down with the disciples and saying, I know you guys have lost all hope, but, but I just feel like, like God is still at work. Like God is still going to do something. And, and I feel like those, those faithful few had this ability within their hearts to know that, that God was going to bring about hope and do something incredible and miraculous. And then when Jesus actually showed back up and, and Peter and the rest of the disciples saw him, they too were suddenly filled with an irrational hope, realizing that there was nothing that God could not do. There was nothing that God could not overcome. Jesus has risen from the dead. He has conquered sin and death. And because of that, the disciples of Christ can have an irrational hope. For me, hopelessness often starts with the phrase, I don't know what to do now. When I, when I am, am walking through life and I'm, I stumble, whether it's something that I've done wrong or something that just happens to me, when I stumble and, and I get overwhelmed with whatever it is that's happened, whether it's being isolated in my home because of a virus, financial problems, stress at the church, um, whatever it is, when I get to a point where I say, I, I don't know what to do, that is, that is the first step for me that leads to hopelessness. Because when I don't know what to do, when I can't see the path to being okay, then I just assume that there is no path. <laughs> this may surprise you, but I oftentimes don't know what to do. And some, usually I think I know what to do, and it turns out I'm wrong. And, and this may surprise you even more. Oftentimes you don't know what to do. But, and here's the big thing that, that Christians get to celebrate. This is why we have a rational hope. But Christians can be assured that even when we don't know what to do, and because we don't know what to do, things seem hopeless. God does know what to do. And, and Christ is at work. And when Christ is at work, we can be hopeful. This is the times in which Jesus suddenly is resurrected and comes back from the dead because he has a plan. And we can't see it. Nobody would have thought Jesus was going to come back. The, the disciples certainly didn't get it. People don't just come back from the dead. But then he did. And because he did, hope was received. Because he did, we, we learned that, that Jesus always does have a plan. That there is always something that, that he can do that brings about hope and a future for you and for me. So, you may not believe in a path forward. 
You may not believe that, that, that we can recover. You may not see how you're going to get your job back or your finances back or get back on track with your family or your marriage or whatever is happening. You, you may not see a path forward, but I promise you, God does. That doesn't mean the path is going to look the way that we always want it to look, but it does mean there is hope. There is a path forward to goodness and joy. Jesus rose from the dead. And because Jesus rose from the dead, you and I can be hopeful. So what I want to talk about now is some of the ways and reasons why we can sort of latch on to hope. And and we can find irrational hope even when we are in those dark places. Because I I promise I get it. I promise. When we are in times of, of hardship and difficulty and suffering and confusion, when we're in those times, it can be really tough to be irrationally hopeful because every rational part of our brain says that there's no path forward. But, but there's some things that we can do. There's some, there's some places that we can go in our hearts that allow us to have an irrational hope. And an irrational hope is a place of joy and a place that we should all seek. So let me start with this. We have a rational hope because Jesus assures us that we can be born again and made new. A couple of years ago, I was uh, car shopping. I haven't bought a car in a while, but I was car shopping, and I was looking for a a used vehicle, and I found on on, uh, the internet somewhere, I found this car, and it looked nice. I I hadn't seen it in person yet. It looked nice. It seemed clean. It had relatively low miles on it, but the price was significantly lower than equivalent vehicles. And as I dug a little bit deeper, I saw that the car had a salvage title on it. And a salvage title, if you don't know, simply means that the car had been totaled at some point or or, or, or wrecked, and the insurance had paid out on it, and then somebody had went ahead and repaired it, and then they were trying to sell it. So the car at some point had some significant damage, probably, and then the car was repaired. Now, the reason that that car was so much cheaper than a car next to it that was the same car with the same miles is because that car had been broken and repaired. And nobody in their right mind sees two cars that are the same car with the same value and the same mileage. One has a salvage title and one doesn't and, and buys the car with the salvage title. Nobody does that. Everybody wants a new car because we know that as things are repaired, there's probably some little weird things here and there that may not make it quite as dependable or, or function quite as well as the new car. We, we know that this is how cars work. And so when you get a choice, of course, you will always choose the car that has the, the clean title. As we walk through life, we too are damaged. We suffer. We face obstacles, we, we face things that, that hurt us deeply, and, and just like cars, there's big and small. There's dents and there's dings and there's small words that are, that are inconsiderate or, or, or ill-timed that hurt us a little. And then there's these big collision things like, like bankruptcy and divorce and layoffs and, and, and illness. There's these huge things in our life that damage us in massive, massive ways. And when that happens... When, when we see ourselves damaged in these, these huge ways, I, I, think, I think sometimes we worry that we'll never go back together right. <laughs> that we'll never go back together the way that we were meant to. That no matter what sort of patches and repairs and, and new parts we put on, that we're in our souls, in our hearts, we are ir- irreversibly damaged and therefore not able to be okay. But Jesus is risen. And because Jesus is risen, we have this amazing gift that's offered to us and talked about in 1 Peter. It says this, Blessed be the God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Did you catch that? We, we can be made new. We can have a, a new 
birth, which means we don't have to be the, the old beat-up car that's, that's had its dings patched over and, and had its parts replaced, but, but it's not quite right still underneath the hood. No, we can be made something completely new and completely different. I, I want to show you a little something about cookies. Good morning, church family. Just like so many of you, I have been at home a lot over the past couple of uh, weeks. And I was here in my kitchen working on my sermon, and there was a couple of cookies sitting in, in here, and it gave me an idea to illustrate uh, the point I want to make. So, this is the Snickerdoodle cookie. Now, a Snickerdoodle cookie is a good cookie, um, but it is inferior, as you I'm sure know, to an M&M cookie. Everyone knows an M&M cookie is better than a Snickerdoodle cookie. Now, if I wanted to turn this Snickerdoodle cookie into an M&M cookie, I would I could take it to the sink back there, I could rinse off, um, the cinnamon and sugar and I could tr get some M&Ms and I could try to jam them into the cookie and then I could serve that but we both know that that isn't gonna make as good of a cookie as the M&M cookie that was baked that way it's got limits right it can't be turned into something else when Jesus Christ says that we are born again when we can be born again it means we can mean be made into something completely new completely different and better than we've ever been before so when you and I are made new, he's not talking about dusting off the stuff, trying to patch things together. He's talking about making us into something better, something wonderful. Without the baggage of the past or, or the pain of the past, we can be healed and we can be transformed. So, I hope this little message on cookies is helpful for you uh, to understand just how powerful it is that Jesus Christ says that we can be born again. You see, being made new means that we are able to have irrational hope because our potential is no longer limited. We are not relegated to, once we, to being what we once were. We now have the ability to be something that we've never been before. We can be people of hope and love and generosity and kindness. We can be better than we've ever been before. We are something different, something new. When Jesus was resurrected from the dead, suddenly everything changed. And you and I have the ability to be people and become people and do things that we could not do before. We could be more forgiving than we've ever been, more generous than we've ever been, kinder than we've ever been, more hopeful than we've ever been. Being made new, being born again, it is a, a massive transformation, a transformation in who we are, foundationally, to the core. We are new people that can do new and amazing things. You see, our irrational hope comes from the Spirit, and we do not have to be ashamed. The type of transformation that we are talking about, the, the type of transformation from old to new, the, the, to a person of hopelessness, to a person of, of irrational hope, that, that transformation, that move, that's not something that we just muster in ourselves. That is a gift from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God comes into our life and fills us up and enables us to have a hope that did not exist before. We can be and become and hope in ways uh, that before we were incapable. Romans 5.5 5 says this, And hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. If you want to be hopeful, if you want to be a person that's, that's hopeful, because it's a gift from the Holy Spirit, we don't just muster inside of us hope. We don't just cook up enough hope to walk through life in the way that we're talking about. What we do is, is we pray. And we ask the Holy Spirit, God, I want to be more hopeful. Please give me the gift of of hope. The kind of hope that we are talking about, that stuff only comes from the Holy Spirit. That, that is a gift that is given to us, just as grace and salvation and, and all the things that Jesus gives us. The gift of hope is something that, that we can't create in ourselves. It's something that has to be given to us by God. So if you want to be the kind of person that I'm talking about, the kind of person that, that, that doesn't ignore problems, but has hope in the midst of those problems, 
then we need to spend more time on our knees asking God to fill us with an irrational, irrevocable, unshakable hope. And, and that, my friends, is a prayer that God loves to answer. When we ask God for hope, certainly we need to open our hearts and our minds and, and decide and, and commit to an attitude of hope, but, but it only really happens when we, when we ask God for help. And we pray that he fills us up and gives us the ability to hope. And when God does that, life changes. We can also be irrationally hopeful because that we know that God will have the last word. As I said in the beginning, Hope does not mean ignoring problems. Christians have a long history of being with those who are suffering. We know and are praying for the people in the medical community who are are going through really thick times right now. We know and are praying for people who have lost jobs and employment. We know and are praying for people who are lonely and isolated during this time. We know and are praying for people who are trapped in their homes with their family and and tensions and, and, and tempers are beginning to flare and get high. We know all of that. And And we face it head on. But we can be irrationally hopeful because we know that in the midst of all of that pain and all of that suffering, that Jesus will always have the last word. Isaiah 40 says this, But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagle. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be Faint. That ancient scripture reminds us today that even when so much suffering and pain happens, we know that eventually, tomorrow, with an endurance and, and, and kindness, God will bring about a hopeful and joyful and wonderful future that God will have the last word. The last word will not be a word of death or suffering, but will be a word of resurrection and hope. Jesus Christ came back from the dead. We celebrate Easter Sunday because we celebrate the resurrection, the victory over sin and death. And certainly, Jesus will have a victory over coronavirus. And so maybe the irrational hope that we have isn't that irrational at all. Maybe it just makes sense to believe that God will do what God has always done, that he will overcome and bring about goodness in the world. I choose to have a hope that seems to many to be irrational. I choose to have a hope that I am, that I am proud of and, and makes me unafraid. I choose to have a hope in the power and the grace of Jesus Christ. I choose to have hope in you and in me to be used by God to bring goodness. I am celebrating today and I am hopeful because of the amazing story that is Easter. I celebrate with you because Christ is risen. He's risen indeed. And because of the power of Christ, because of of how he came into that that very dark time, as as the disciples were, were gathered and huddled and afraid and hopeless, Jesus showed up. Beyond any reason, beyond beyond any uh, any sort of thing that makes any sort of sense, Jesus showed up. And when that happened, irrational hope was born. And all those who put their faith in Jesus Christ today can be hopeful that even in the midst of very confusing and difficult and scary times, God is present. And while we may not always see a clear path forward for how every problem will be solved, We believe irrationally sometimes that Jesus is here and that hope is real. And we hope beyond all hoping. We are are certain that Christ will work. So I invite you today to embrace the spirit of Easter. That in the midst of darkness you remember that, that Christ has been born again. Christ has has risen again, and you and I have been born again. 
in the midst of, of scary and difficult times, we can be a people of hope. And we can share that hope with the, with the world. So I encourage you now to go and to be a people of hope. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Spirit of the living God, Spirit of the living God, we only want to hear your voice. We're hanging on every word. Spirit of the living God, Spirit of the living God, we want to know you. message of hope to the world. For the next six weeks at Connect, we are talking about irrational hope, and I also want to challenge you to share some of that irrational hope with the world. I've uh, been sitting down for a few minutes and writing a few notes of encouragement to people uh, that I care for, saying, uh, I hope the Lord is with you and, and, and God is with you and, and I'm praying for you, these sorts of things. Maybe you can uh, send over a, a bouquet of flowers 
an email, a phone call, a, a social media message, anything that you can do to offer hope and encouragement to, the, to another. So for the next six weeks, uh, I encourage you to, to take this challenge, offer hope to another person, uh, and then maybe even take a little video and send it to, to me at Connect Church or, or, or to communications at connectumc.org. And we may feature that on uh, our sermons in the next couple of weeks as we share together how we are taking the hope that Christ gives us and offers it to the world. So now I want to say this. May you go from this virtual Easter worship service in peace. May God be with you. May you be hopeful because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And may you offer that hope to the world because he is risen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, go in peace. Amen. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He, is risen. he, is risen. he has he risen indeed. Woo! Come see the mournful grave where once a body lay. I got in human form. Disappeared in his forgiveness. Jesus.